I don't want to simplify this to faith over fear because I'm scared. But God isn't keeping me there. Can't turn off the headlines. My ears hear what they hear. And my heart beats faster than it's beaten in years. And yeah, it's overwhelming. This life will move you to tears. So I don't want to simplify this to faith over fear because I'm scared. But God isn't keeping me there. I know somebody watching is losing a job. I know somebody watching lost somebody they love. I know somebody watching doesn't believe in my God. And look, I'm not here to argue or try to pick sides. I just want to be honest about how I'm surviving. I think God became man, pushed heaven aside, lived the only perfect life and exchanged it for mine, and then died. And he even asked why. And yo, I ask him all the time out loud and in my mind, and I don't have all the answers, but who dies did not die? Who comes back to life and looks us in the eyes and says, I've been where you've been. I've cried where you've cried. I've hurt where you've hurt, but I rose so you'll rise. There's hope for our world. There's hope for our lives. Just know there's a God who didn't stay in the sky. Just know there's a God who's okay with your why. Just know there's a God who's forever on high. Just know there's a God who died, then not died. So I don't want to simplify this to faith over fear, but our God rose from the grave. And if we put our hope in that truth, we have nothing to fear. Well, what an appropriate message uh, for this time in our lives and for this sermon from Matthew chapter 4. Go ahead and grab your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 4. That's, uh, that video was produced by Michael Harris Jr. He's one of the kids, uh, thousands of kids that have grown up in this church over the years using his gifts for the kingdom. And it got me thinking about all the kids that have grown up here and are now serving here. Back in the 1900s, I've told you this, I was the youth pastor. We had this youth worship thing called Oasis. And I just started thinking and writing down the names of people who still go to Eastview Christian Church and are part of our fellowship that were in my youth ministry back then. So shout out to Tyler and Jessica Harry, shout out to Lauren and Blake Cottrell, uh, to Clinton and Ashley Chapman, uh, to Joe and Rachel Dalton, to Ann and Matt McLean, to Shana and Jason Aho, uh, to Jerry Schwartz and Brittany, to Darren and George Jessica York, to um, Wes and Melinda Johnson, uh, Rebecca and Joel Paps, to Chad and Roxy Parker, uh, Robbie and Candace Osinga, uh, Adrian Schultzenbach, Jess Jessica and Matt Smith, Nick and Lisa Striegel, Leslie and Jesse Lamphere, all of you. And by the way, if I didn't mention you and you're still here, I'm so sorry. Uh, I just wrote these down trying to remember some people. So greetings to all of you and, um, and all of those old uh, Oasis people. By the way, uh, somebody around here is getting old because some of you I have baptized and married and dedicated your children and then watched your kids get baptized. Somebody's getting old here. Probably not you, just me, right? Uh, one other thing that I, one more shout out that we got in the e-news this week, uh, in the email this week, uh, was from John Pate. He wants to say to his mom, a uh, shout out to his mom, Nancy. She got a clean bill of health with her cancer this week. So God bless you, Nancy. We're so excited about that. It's really, really cool stuff. We're celebrating with you. Well, now let's move to the Word of God today. In Matthew chapter 4, that's where we're going to be hanging out. And I'll have to say, uh, as we look at the very first followers of Jesus Christ, there would have been little to zero chance for me to be chosen as one of Jesus' very first followers. It's not because I'm unworthy or I'm not that smart or not that talented. Uh, he could choose a wiser people because that, in fact, didn't really matter to Jesus. All those things are true, by the way. But I, I would not have been followed, uh, chosen as one of his first followers because um, his first followers that we know by name were fishermen. And uh, I'm not a fisherman. I'm sure we have lots of fisher men, women, and children out there, fisher families and fisher people. And uh, if you are, I mean, you guys can laugh and glance at each other because you know you love going fishing and you love being a part of that reality. Um, but my dad didn't fish, my grandpa didn't fish, and therefore I don't fish. Now that's not to say that I've never been fishing. Over the years of ministry, a lot of great people have tried to turn me into a fisherman. Oh, you'll like it. And my first thing is I never catch anything. Oh, I'll, I'll teach you to, to fish. I'll teach you how to do it. I've been deep sea fishing in Florida. I've been river fishing in Missouri. I've been lake fishing in Arizona. I've been pond fishing in Wapella. But as those of you who do fish know, going fishing is not the same thing as actually fishing. 
But in ways I don't have time to explain, I'm not and I never will be a fisherman. Honestly, I don't want to. Let me give you four reasons why I never will be. This is just fun stuff about fishing. Number one, attention span. I believe fishing takes uh, the person who's trying to do the fishing to have more attention span than the fish that they're trying to catch, and I simply do not. Number two reason, bait. I don't mind getting my hands dirty, but uh, man, uh, in order to fish, I've had to handle worms and squid and small fish, and just no thank you. It makes me want to wash my hands right now. Uh, no talking. Uh, I, I don't understand uh, any pastime where we go out with friends and we sit in a boat or on the shore and we really don't talk a whole lot. We're supposed to be quiet so the fish will bite. And number four, catch and release. I love eating fish all day long. I don't understand a sport that says, let's catch them and then throw them back in. I actually feel sorry for those fish that have the same attention span I do who get caught 10 or 12 times a day and have holes in their face and his friends make fun of him saying, Hey, that's not real. Stop eating that bait. Anyway, I digress. See, I've illustrated my point. I'm not a fisherman. Now, I know some of you today are going to say, I'm going to get past you out fishing. Please just don't. Don't waste your time or my time. This is only a sermon introduction for our time together in Matthew 4 because the first name followers of Jesus were fishermen. And since we are fearless Church of Christ followers and these first followers were fishermen, then today we want to get to the Word and we want to understand what did Jesus call these guys to and what did He ask of them and what did He promise them in this text. So let's just read it together. It's Matthew 4, starting with verse 18. Um, and it catches Jesus in a geographical place called, easy for me to say, <laughs> the Sea of Galilee. Let me read this. The Word of the Lord. Matthew 4, 18. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, He saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea. For they were fishermen. He said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and they followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Now, if you want to flip through your, your scriptures, uh, you can. If you don't, I'll just read it to you. But Matthew 9 has a similar calling. Matthew 9, 9, as Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And then one last time, I want to look in Matthew chapter 19 for some more following stuff. Uh, Peter says in verse 27, Peter says, See, we have left everything to follow you, and what will we have? Jesus replies in verse 29, Everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. That's the word of the Lord. I know it's already moving in your heart. Let me pray and ask the Holy Spirit to guide us through this time. God, would you come now by the power of your Spirit? There are no barriers for you. You are eternal and cosmic and supernatural, and you see every person watching and listening to this sermon, right? And you see them. And so, God, would you give me the right words to lift up your word, Jesus, and your holy word, the Bible, so that people will hear from God today? Let every person hearing hear God's voice today. Every person watching see clearly what you're calling them to. Every heart would be open to your gospel. God, would you do that in a miraculous way in this setting as only you can? I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today we're beginning a new series that looks at life after the resurrection. Obviously, last week we celebrated Easter, the resurrection. Jesus is still alive. Here we are a week later. Guess what? He's still alive and we're still here. So how are we supposed to be the followers of Jesus Christ after the resurrection. And that's what we're going to look at the next several weeks. And we're going to look at that through the lens of our vision. And as I've said before, we are called a fearless church of, listen, Christ followers. That's how we describe ourselves. We're followers of Jesus Christ. Now, maybe today you're saying, oh, I don't need to, I can check out of this sermon right now because I'm not a follower of Jesus Christ. Well, this sermon is for you because Peter and Andrew and James and John were not followers either when this story began. So maybe God's going to speak to you in that way. Maybe you're saying, I've been a follower of Jesus for years. Well, here's the deal. He's still walking, and we're still learning, and he's still got stuff for us to do. So this sermon is for you if you've been a Christian for 70 years, or if you've not even made a decision to follow Jesus yet. If you're young or old, if you're a kid, all of you can get this today. Because we're talking about following Jesus Christ 
And, um, and we're going to begin with um, Jesus seeing us and calling us. This whole story begins with Jesus taking a walk. He's walking by the Sea of Galilee. Now, um, the Sea of Galilee is in the northern part of, of Israel. I didn't know if I was going to do this or not, but I'm going to give you this, this hokey kind of, uh, you know, this, this illustration. Pretend that my, my fist here, my hand here, is the Sea of Galilee. That's kind of the shape of it. In fact, the, the word in the Hebrew language, Galil, means round or circular. It's not totally round. It's about 12 miles long and 8 miles across. But it's the lake. It's the Sea of Galilee. And on this Sea of Galilee, Jesus is watch, walking up here on the North Shore. Uh, somewhere around here is Capernaum. By the way, every, th every time I mark something on a map, even if it's my fist, it's exactly authentic and perfectly situated. Capernaum is here. Jesus is walking here, somewhere around here, where he sets up his hometown for his ministry. We believe Peter and James and John live there because Peter's uh, mother-in-law lived there. Anyway, they're out here somewhere on this shore, on the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus is walking, and he's just walking on the shore. I've walked this actual shore, this place. And he just looks out and he goes, oh, there's, there's Peter and Andrew, um, and they're, they're, they're fishing. And he just says to them, hey, follow me. I love this in verse 18. Don't miss this. He saw two brothers and said, follow me. In verse 21, he saw two other brothers and says, follow me. When we read in Matthew chapter 9, verse 9, he sees Matthew sitting at a tax collector. I think it's very important for us to understand that as Jesus walks, he watches for us. He sees us in, in our everyday activities. And he sees these guys who are blue-collar workers. They're making a good living. They're not as poor as maybe some of the people in Galilee. They've got fish to eat at least every day. He's walking on the North Shore, and he calls them with a simple, follow me. Now, something else about Capernaum gets Matthew into this story. Because if you see, again, our map of Capernaum here, uh, you, and Capernaum is right here on the shore of Galilee, North Shore, um, this is the place where Matthew was sitting as well. There's a major Roman road that comes through here and down around uh, the lake. And so he's probably giving, uh, he's probably taxing people who are traveling. He could be also um, taxing people who are sailing across from this non-Jewish part of the sea up here, so that he, uh, so they, they can receive taxes for goods coming in to the harbor. Matthew is a tax collector, and Jesus is walking along in Capernaum, probably along the road. There's a small booth, taxing booth there, and he sees him at the tax booth, and he calls him to follow him. Guys, I want you to see, just, this is just free sermon stuff. I hadn't intended to say this, but the Holy Spirit's telling me to tell you this. Okay. Jesus sees us where we are. You may think you're not important, just some fishermen out fishing on the, the Sea of Galilee, but Jesus sees them. And Jesus sees even the people that you would not expect. When Jesus sees Matthew, Matthew is hated in this culture. He's not a popular guy, but he, he calls even and looks at and sees even religious outsiders. And by religious outsider for Matthew, I mean he's way outside. Jesus, if you're an outsider today, Jesus sees you. If you're just going about life today, Jesus sees you. No matter what you are, what you're doing, what you're about, Jesus sees and Jesus calls. That's the word there in verse 21. It, literally, the word uh, is a word that means to shout out, to yell. He called uh, James and John, these, these sons of Zebedee, these two other brothers. He calls out to them. So you can imagine, maybe to get over the, the sound of the waves uh, splashing up on the shore or the sound of people working or people walking by, he just yells out, hey, James, John, follow me. He yells it out. Now, this is a practical thing for Jesus to do right now to get over the sound of everything that's happening on the water. But it's also a very spiritual and theological concept that Jesus calls us. In fact, no one ever comes to Jesus unless he calls them. He has to first say, hey, follow me. Only can we follow him after he invites us to do so. I just formed a sentence kind of like Yoda. I don't know what happened there, but hey, let's just go with it. All right? I've got lots of Bible references there in your notes. I hope you're looking at those. Maybe you'll take some time later to look through those. But just let me tell you some stuff that the Bible tells us about being called. The Bible refers to us who follow as, as those who have been called to be saints. We are called in the grace of Christ, the Bible says. We have been called to the hope and the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. We also, and so we are encouraged to walk worthy of our calling. 
2 Thessalonians 2, 13 and 14 tells us the whole story. We give thanks to God for you, brothers and sisters, beloved of the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. To this He called you through our gospel. Well, some of you may be watching right now going, ah, man, I wish Jesus would come to my place of work and my school. I wish He'd come to my house and He'd walk into my world and He'd call me. I'd love that to happen. I just want to encourage you today that that's, that's what Jesus did. When the Word became flesh, as John tells us in John 1, when, when we find Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus left heaven and He became man so that He could come into your world. He may not come into your exact workplace, but He understands it. And since He went to the trouble of meeting us as humanity, He is still walking His way into our world every day by His Spirit. How do I know that God is walking into your world today? Well, here we are in the midst of a pandemic and stay-at-home orders, and you're here at church watching, and I'm telling you about Jesus Christ. Some of you have been praying for a sign from God. Some of you have been asking God to move miraculously in, in your life. Some of you have been saying, God, if you're real, speak to me. Well, here we are. He's in your world. He's at your boat. He's at your booth. And he's looking you in the eye through his word and through the words of this preacher, and he's saying to you, hey, I'm here, and I see you, and I'm calling you. So, uh, again, Jesus comes into our world and He calls us. Now, what happens next in each of these callings to follow is what would be understood for first century followers of any um, rabbi as a disciple. Following always, you can write this down, following always, always requires that we leave something. It always means a leaving. And we are told that Peter and Andrew immediately, look in verse 20, immediately they left their nets. Now, that's the visual for us today. These fishing nets are very, very important uh, to a first century um, fisherman. They don't fish the way that we did. Now, I'm going to try to demonstrate for you, not really in a, in a very uh, bold way uh, and noisy way, but uh, I'm going to demonstrate for you. These nets usually came with weighted balls at the bottom of them. I've actually seen these on the Sea of Galilee. And uh, what happens is they're really huge. And the fisherman would throw them out of the boat or in shallow water off the edge of the shoreline. He would throw this net out. And as the, as the weight sank to the bottom and fish swam in, it would trap them and they would pull these nets in filled with fish. This is the fishing device that a first century... Here I am, by the way. I'm not a fisherman. I'm giving you lessons on how to fish in the first century. I have no idea if I could ever do it, but that's how it works because I've studied and I know the history of that. And the point that I want to make to you today is that when Peter and John walked away from that net, they were walking away. I'm smooth as usual, guys. Just because we're online doesn't mean I'm not going to be somebody who drops his Bible. Uh, they were walking away from their livelihood. I want you to see this. To leave this piece of equipment behind, to leave this net behind, to say they immediately left their nets means they are leaving their lives as professional fishermen. They are not fishermen now. They are followers of Jesus Christ, disciples of His. The net's so important as Jesus takes a few steps down, uh, uh, down the shoreline, He sees two other guys, two other fishermen, who are mending their nets. Because these nets are everything. You have to have nets to fish in the first century world. Luke tells us that these guys, James and John, were actually partners in fishing with Andrew and Peter. We don't know exactly what that means, but these guys also leave something. When they're called in verse 21, the Bible tells us that immediately they left their boat and their father. Not only have they left their nets, which means I can't catch fish, they've left their boats, which means I can't get to the deep water to catch fish, and they left their father sitting in the boat. They left a family business. Now again, don't make these guys seem like bad guys. It's probably a business that he had other people to help him uh, get the fish. And, and, but they said, it's time to go. Matthew did the same thing in Matthew 9, 9. Matthew left his job. He was sitting there taking taxes, getting rich by, by you know, really scandalizing people and stealing from them. And then uh, Jesus says, follow me. And he goes, I'm done with that. I'm not going to be a tax collector anymore. I am going to be a follower of Jesus Christ. There are other leaves uh, or people that are asked to leave in the Scripture. Some do and some don't. Remember, during our cost study, Jesus asked the rich young man, in Matthew 19, to sell everything he had and give to the poor and then come follow me. And the rich young man said, I'm not leaving the riches. That some people wanted to come up to Jesus and say, Jesus, I'll follow you. And he tells them, well, the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And it, it indicates that those people didn't follow. I don't want to follow Jesus if it's going to be uncomfortable. 
I don't have a place to lay my head. Okay, I'm out. I thought you were going to stay at a nice hotel, right, when we follow. I, I thought I could keep my money and follow. I thought I could go bury my father and follow in Luke 9. I thought I could, you know, go say goodbye to my family and follow. And Jesus says, no, you got to leave families and funerals and farms and, and arrangements. You've got you to leave your jobs. You've got to leave your riches if you want to follow me. That's why I read that, that passage in Matthew 19, uh, 21. It gives us an idea of what real following is about. Peter says, and Jesus doesn't deny it, Master, we have left everything to follow you. And that's true. Coming to Jesus means we give, up, um, we give up everything. And that begins with sin. To follow Jesus, the first thing we do when we come to Jesus as a follower is we go, we're done with sin. I'm leaving sin behind me. Uh, many people love this story in John 8. It's one of my favorites as well, where the woman caught in the act of adultery is condemned by the crowd. But then Jesus says, who is without sin among you? Throw the first stone. And she's left alone with Jesus. And we love it. And I love it because I need this. I need forgiveness and grace. He looks at her and he says, hey, neither do I condemn you. Oh, to have Jesus look at me and say, I don't condemn you. That's awesome. But we sometimes forget the next line. Neither do I condemn you. Now go and leave your life of sin. See, Jesus doesn't want to just be gracious to us. He was tender, but he also is not endorsing of the stuff that keeps us from him. Romans 6, 2 asks this rhetorical question. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Well, Pastor Mike, I'm a follower. You're a follower. Are you saying that you're sin-free, that you never do anything wrong, that you never sin? Absolutely not. I'm as susceptible to anyone to being tempted by greed and overindulgence and pride and lust and impatience and anger and selfishness. Those are just a few of the sins that I'm tempted by. And maybe you are too. I'm not saying to you that I or anybody else who follows Jesus Christ is perfect and, and sinless. What I am saying is that we have left sin behind. I'm done with sin. Sin has done nothing but bring harm into my life and the lives of those around me. Sin has done nothing but ruin this entire world. There is no sin you can commit, as mentioned in the Bible, and it's going to bless you and turn out well in the end. So when I sin, I quickly repent, and, I, and I'm going to make up a word here. I re-leave everything behind me. I don't like sin. I don't need sin. I sometimes sin, but as soon as I can, I get it behind me because to follow Jesus Christ is to leave something and it begins with sin. And then beyond that, we give up everything. You, you probably noticed they gave up their relationship with their father. Uh, Jesus mentions father, mother, sisters, brothers, lands, money, jobs. It's different for every person. Every person gives up and leaves something different. Peter and, and Andrew left their nets. James and John left their boats and their father. Those must be significant. Matthew left the tax collector's booth. Everybody's called to leave something different, but you have to leave something because God is calling us to follow, and that means we have to leave. I want to just say it this way. Following Jesus simply cannot be whatever and Jesus. What's your whatever today? Because Jesus is saying, no, I just want it to be only me. We sing these songs in a lot of different eras, songs like uh, Christ is enough and Christ alone, and he is all I need. Jesus is saying to you today, you don't need anything else. You don't need the nets. You don't need the boat. You don't need your relationships. You don't need your money. You don't need your career. You need none of that stuff. Just follow me. I'm all you need. And that's what he's saying to us today. So what are you going to leave behind? What is it that God's calling you to leave behind? Jesus is calling someone today to leave behind a life of sin and follow him. And if that's you, text hello right now the number on your screen. We want to follow up with you. If you're going, I'm done with this life of sin. I want to put it behind me. We want to help you do that. Jesus is calling someone today, I believe, to leave a relationship that's keeping them from following him well. Jesus is calling someone to leave a possession that's too important to them, has too much value in their life. He's saying, get rid of that. So he's, he's telling somebody today, leave the title that's so important to you and means so much to you. Leave that uh, so you can follow me better. He's telling somebody today, leave that dream. I know you've had that dream since you've been a little kid, but that's not my dream for you. i got a better one. Leave that dream and follow me. He may be calling someone here, actually, this happens at Eastview uh, quite a bit, actually, to leave their job and to get into a professional uh, ministry place, to, to do vocational ministry. We have a, th a thing here called the residency program. Maybe you're just going, you know what? I've not been, been at work for two months. It's time for me to just jump and leave that behind and go into ministry. I don't know what God's saying to you today, but I, I want you to use this visual of this net. This is the ultimate sign of leaving in Matthew 5. They left the net behind 
because they were done being fishermen. And so I use that and make a decision today. I, I, like to, I hope I can hear some stories this week of what you've decided to leave behind. But whatever you leave behind, that's not the end of the story. Jesus says, leave, follow me. Leave that and follow me. And that's what, we, that's what the calling is. Uh, even as you think about what you're leaving behind, I want to tell you that fearless following is not just leaving something behind. A lot of us have been told that in Christianity, that you've got to stop doing bad stuff. You've got to leave bad things aligned, uh, behind. You've got to leave anything that's fun, anything that's productive, and anything you want to do has to go by the wayside. That's not what Christianity is. Christianity is Jesus saying, leave that so you can follow me and I will give you life. You think you're living with that? Dump it. I will help you really live. Jesus is calling us into something way better. Matthew 19, 29, in his answer to Peter, he says, Peter, listen, yeah, you've left everything, but everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or fathers or mothers or children or lands for my sake, if you leave something for the sake of following Jesus Christ, here's what he says, you will receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. Guys, listen, you will never leave something behind to follow Jesus, that in the end is more valuable than what you have in Jesus Christ. There will be nobody in glory looking back and going, I wish I would have kept all that stuff and not following Jesus. And when you get to eternal life, you'll go, worth it. In fact, I will go a step further. There are people in this church watching right now that have been Christians 40, 50, 60 years, and I promise you, if you talk to them, none of them would have regrets about what they left behind to follow their Savior. And if you're young today, if you're a student, if you're a college student, if you're a young adult, I promise you, whatever you value, get rid of it. Because Jesus is going to take you a place that's so much better than that. Jesus says, follow me. Now, there's two parts of this I just want to go uh, real quickly through. Uh, one is position, and the other one is process. Following Jesus is a position, and you've got to get in the right position, and then it's a process. And uh, first, we have to understand these words in verse 19. See those words, verse 19, follow me. Uh, actually, it's, it's different than the followed word that we normally talk about. I'll get to in just a moment. But follow me. You guys know this if you've been around Eastview very long. I don't mind getting into the Greek language of the first century. I'm not trying to impress you with my brains because I think I've illustrated clearly today that I'm not that smart. But I've studied, and I think you're smart enough to understand this. The words in the Greek language that we translate follow me in verse 19 are the words in Greek, dute opiso. Dute, and it gives us a clear picture. The reason I'm sharing this with you is because it's a clear picture of what it means to follow Jesus Christ. Jesus literally says to Peter and Andrew, Andrew, Dute, come, and opiso, behind. Come, behind me. That's not because he's on some power trip or he loves authority or likes to be worshipped in some strange kind of way. He's just saying, you've been doing life in your own wisdom, your own strength, your own power. You are successful fishermen, but you know what? I want you to come behind. Let me lead now. Let me be the one in charge of all your stuff. Whatever fearless following is, it is behind Jesus that helps me. Because I, I know that sometimes I have a tendency to run ahead of Jesus or to put my arm around Jesus on the side like we're buds and like he needs my advice. And, and what Jesus really wants from me is like, come behind me. In your marriage, in your work, in your goals, in your health, whatever you got going on, just come behind me. That's the best place for you. I'll lead you to a good place. And that leads us then to the process. Not only is it the right position, get behind me, but it's the process. Following is a process. The other word for following, and we'll look at this a little bit more next week as we continue um, this series after the resurrection. The, the idea of following is that you're in a relationship with Jesus. He's the teacher and you're the learner. Uh, to follow Jesus, uh, when he says, follow me, and, and they follow him, Jesus is actually reversing a first century practice. In the first century, if there was a super smart dude, like I'll name some, some guys like Gamaliel and, uh, and Hillel and some of the famous rabbis in the first century. If you wanted if a super smart kid and you wanted to learn from them, you would go up to them and say, hey, can I follow you? You're the rabbi. You know tons of stuff. I want to learn. Can I be your disciple? The rabbi-disciple relationship. But here's what you need to know about um, a discipleship and being a disciple of Jesus Christ. The word literally means to learn or pupil or student. But it's not the way that you and I think. It's a very organic process. There's no classroom lectures. There are no quizzes or finals or diplomas when it's all said and done. 
Simply, you follow the rabbi, you listen to them, you watch them, you feel them in your heart, and before long, after you've been with them a while, you begin to talk like them and quote them and think like them and see the world through their eyes. Ultimately, Christianity is an invitation from Jesus for you and I to go on a walk with him through life where he leads and we learn constantly as we go. I believe Jesus is still saying to us today, follow me. Whatever you got going on, just follow me. Just watch how I do it. Do you want to understand relationships? Then just watch how I do it. Do you want to understand how you should care for poor people? Just watch how I do it. Do you understand what happens when people criticize you or you know, make fun of you? Just watch how I do it. Do you want to know how to get to heaven? Just watch how I do it. Do you want to enjoy all of the things in life, food and drink and sexuality? Just listen to my words of wisdom. I'll, I'll lead you to a better place than you could ever get on your own. You want to accomplish something great in life? Follow me. Watch, listen, learn. You want a life that matters? You want to change the world? Jesus is saying to us today, hey, don't rush things. Get behind, look, listen, learn. And you'll, and you'll be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Now you might be sitting here, well, how, how can I follow him today? I don't, I'm not walking on the shores of Galilee. I'm not sitting at the tax uh, collector's booth. But Jesus has given us a way. When he left, he gave us a way for us to still follow him. We can still follow him by knowing and obeying his teachings in the scripture. That's what he says in Matthew 28. Teach them to observe everything I've commanded you and obey them. Guys, we begin following Jesus by going, what does Jesus think? Well, read the Bible. And then we, then we follow in his community, his body. If the church is the body of Jesus Christ, then we have to be connected to his body. It's Jesus in the world today. And number three, we listen to his spirit. His spirit was given us as a guide. I've got scriptures there in your notes that, that talk about the, the Bible and, um, and uh, the Holy Spirit and the church. And I hope you'll read those because I think they're important. But we come to this final part. Now, don't you see the progress? Hey, I see you. I'm calling you. Hey, follow me. You're going to have to leave something behind, but follow me. And while you're back there leaving something behind, get behind me and trust me. But here's the cool part. Maybe, maybe you're not excited about that yet. I'm excited about that because I think it's a cool uh, picture of me being a follower. of Jesus. I'm learning as I go. But I love this promise. He says, you know what? Follow me, verse 19, and I will make you fishers of men. I'll take who you are. I'll take what you do. I'll take your abilities. And I'm going to turn you into something spiritual. I'm going to take your earthly giftedness and position, and I'm going to turn it to something spiritual and eternal. <laughs> He's going to use their instincts and their skill and their understanding and their patience for catching fish to evangelize the world. He's going to, he's going to teach them how to catch souls for the eternal kingdom that Jesus is establishing. See, Jesus is going to make them fishers of men. And I want you to see how this happened. Three years after this intense training where they watched Jesus and listened to Jesus and wrote down his words and repeated his words and preached his words, and then his death and his burial and his resurrection. And then they're in Jerusalem and the Holy Spirit comes upon them. And what happens? They start preaching on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. They throw out a net of Jesus' love and his gospel. And on that day, 3,000 people were caught up in the good news. And they received Jesus by faith. And they were baptized into his name. That's a pretty good fishing day. I want you to see that what Jesus said to Peter and James and John and Andrew in Matthew 4, becomes a reality in Acts 2. You're fishermen? I'll make you fishers of men. Did you know that um, Jesus um, made his original followers into people with eternal purpose and significant roles in the kingdom, and he, he intends to do that through you and I? He, he intends to change us. If you don't want to change, don't come to faith in Jesus Christ because he's got something way better than you are. He's got better plans for you than you could ever imagine. You might like fishing. You might be a fisherman. He says, no, that's just, that's just fishing. Let me, let me help you fish in an eternal way for the souls of men. So if he can take a fisher man and make them fishers of men, then he can make stay-at-home moms, moms who are spiritual moms to hundreds. I've seen it happen in the church. If he can make fishermen fishers of men, then he can make corporate executives and business leaders kingdom leaders. 
If he can make uh, you know, fishers uh, of men, uh, fishers, fishermen, fishers of men, then he can make contractors and builders into kingdom builders. He can make musicians and artists into creative communicators for the kingdom. He can make internet experts, internet pastors. He can make landscapers, sowers of good news. He can make world travelers, missionaries. He can make students, students of his word. He can make you into something eternal. He can take who you are and what you've done, your life experience, what you're good at and what you're bad at, all the experiences of your life, and he can take it all the, and, and weave it into one and say, here's what I'm going to make you. Who are you? What do you do? What if you followed Jesus and said, I want to keep doing what I'm doing, and I want to be who God made me to be from the beginning, but I want to do it for an eternal glory and an eternal purpose. How might Jesus change who you are into what he wants you to be? Whatever it is, I know he's doing it. Philippians 1.9 says that he who began a good work in you, I want you to hear that, he's begun a good work in you. When you start following Jesus, he just begins a good work in you by forgiving your sins and changing you. But he who began a good work in you, Philippians 1, 6 says, will carry it to completion to the day of Jesus Christ. He's began a good work in you, and he will make you into what he wants you to be for his glory and for his kingdom. If he says, hey, fisherman, you're going to be a fisher's of men, he's going to do that. If he says he's making you to something, he's going to do that. He does it in a variety of ways. Again, I've got some scriptures listed there. I don't have time to go through them all. But uh, he uses a lot of different ways to to do this. I, I want to encourage you with this, and, and you're not going to like this, and I don't think I like it, but God is using the COVID-19 virus and all things related to it, the stay-at-home orders and all the, you know, no going to work and no going to restaurants and the social distancing and washing. He's using all of this, as much as you may not like it, he's using this to make you into something that will be useful for the kingdom of God. Don't look at this thing and go, oh, I'm tired of this. When can we get back to normal? I hate this. This is terrible. I know. I understand emotionally. It's not easy. You imagine what it feels like for an extrovert to preach to an empty room and to not see the people that I love on staff. But I want you to embrace this because God is doing something in us. He's making fishers of men into fishermen. He's making us, what we used to be in January, into something great for the kingdom of God. 1 Thessalonians 5 gives us this church word. It's the word sanctification. God is sanctifying us. He's making us holy. Now may God sanctify you completely. He will surely do it. Well, after the resurrection, after Jesus had risen from the dead, the Bible tells us in John 21 that Peter and James... John and Andrew, with a couple of other disciples, had gone fishing. They're right back in a boat. I'm assuming they're on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee, near Capernaum, where their relatives lived, and they'd spent so much time with Jesus, and they're fishing. And once again, Jesus walks on that same shore, and he calls out to them about fishing. It's another fishing story. And uh, the Bible doesn't use the same terminology of calling, but he asked them, do you have any fish? I'm assuming they're way out. And he's yelling, he's calling, hey, you have any fish? And uh, no, we've been fishing all night. And so Jesus says, try the other side. Try the other side. You know, these are experienced fishermen. They know how to fish. Who's this guy on the shore telling us how to fish? They do. The Bible tells us that their nets were so full of fish that their boats begin to sink. And in that moment, Peter goes, I know who that is. He not only understands fishing, he understands fishers of men. And that's what he's called us to. The Bible says Peter couldn't wait for them to drag the haul of fish in. He jumped out of the boat and swam to Jesus on the shore, where Jesus gives him the important words. I love this about Jesus and his relationship with Peter and his calling for me and you today as fearless followers. The first words Jesus said on the same beach was, hey, Follow me. And after all this miraculous catch of fish, the last words we have recorded for Jesus to Peter in the book of John is, are these two simple words that I just want to leave you with today. Here's what Jesus is saying. Here's, here's what it means to leave nets behind. Here's what it means to, to do something great and grand for the kingdom. If you want to be a part of something that lasts for eternity with purpose, then Jesus has two words for Peter, for James, for John, 
for me, for you. Follow me. Amen.